For tonight's session, it is breaking myths number one, religion, yanas, and lineages, the first of a series of talks. Dr. Punya Wong is currently an associate professor in internal medicine at Monash University, Malaysia, based in Johor Bahru. He's an established Dharma speaker who has been regularly sharing Dharma in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, HCMC, and Bangkok for the last two decades. He had also been invited to speak at the third, seventh, and eighth global conference on Buddhism. Due to the recent COVID-19 pandemic, in this era of new norm, Dr. Wong's focus has now shifted to sharing Dharma online via Zoom, Facebook, and WhatsApp. So before we start today's session, let me share with you an interesting story on Dr. Punya and his special affinity with Subang Jaya Buddhist Association. Dr. Punya and the late Bante Mahachara have known each other long before Bante had gone forth. And all along, the late Bante Mahachara was very supportive of Dr. Punya's Dharma works for the Buddha Sasan. The late Bante Mahachara had also shared a close bond with Subang Jaya Buddhist Association and his devotees. He was very keen to invite Dr. Punya to give a Dharma talk in SJBA before his passing. However, it did not happen until today. And that is why tonight's online Dharma sharing session by Dr. Punya is a very meaningful one as it fulfills the wish of the late Bante Mahachara. Let us specially dedicate tonight's Dharma sharing session in memory of the late Bante Mahachara. So without further ado, I shall now hand over to Dr. Punya Wong for his Dharma sharing tonight. Namo Buddhaya, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Thank you so much for inviting me. May we all have some peace and calmness as we listen and learn the Buddha Dhamma. And may we also use this session to remember our late teacher, the late Venerable Mahachara. Now, today is the first of a series whereby we will share with us, all of us here, with regards to some of the things which we hold dear because of culture and tradition, but which may not necessarily be true. Now, anyone who is a student of the Buddha Dharma would have read that the Buddha challenged the cherished beliefs and practices of the established religions of his time 2,600 years ago. I ask that we just imagine that we are now eyewitnesses 2,600 years ago to events which unfold before us. 2,600 years ago in Northeast India, Brahminism was the main religion. And sitting right at the very apex was the Brahmins, who in the caste system were ranked the highest. And they had knowledge of Vedic Sanskrit. They understood what was in the sacred books, and they understood and knew how to perform rites, rituals, and offerings. And in many ways, they became the intermediaries between the lesser mortals and the gods. The prevailing religion at that time, as I said, is Brahminism. Hinduism has not come into being yet. What we see today as Hinduism came later on. Now, Brahminism believed in a supreme creator God, which as all of you know, the Lord Buddha rejected. These gods need to be offered sacrifices. And these sacrifices could range from very humble, 
ghee fire or grain or flowers or fruits to very elaborate sacrifices of kettles. And the rich and the powerful would offer a lot, while the humble people may just offer some ghee. Now, the Buddha again was against this. And you would have read in both the legends of the Buddha and within the Pali Canon how the Buddha argued against these sacrifices and asked people to use common sense and logic instead. Now, these sacrifices were complex things that required very specific manners of handling them. And these could only be done by the hereditary priests. Again, the Buddha rejected that there is a class of people who are able to do it, or the rest of us could not. Another common practice that the Buddha rejected was ritual bathing. Now, ritual bathing is practiced even today, 2,600 years later. Widely believed that if one bathes in a sacred river, one's misdemeanors and sins will be washed away. Within the Pali Canon, the Buddha was recorded to have argued against this and even used the metaphor that if this is true, then all the fishes in the rivers would surely be in heaven because all their misdeeds and sins would have been washed away. As an eyewitness 2,600 years ago, you would have realized that the Buddha went against the order of the day. He would have been seen as a rebel. Now, religion organized in many ways and cages us. What spirituality frees us. When the Lord Buddha sent the first 60 Arahants out to share the Dhamma, he told them that you are now freed of all divine and human bondages. Very often we glance across this line without realizing how important it is. I repeat, the Buddha said, you all are now freed of all divine and human bondages. You are freed. You are no longer bound by many things which religion dictates. You are no longer bound by the many things which human culture dictates. Women can be equally awakened. There are no secret rights. You do not have to be encaged by religious beliefs that, oh, if you are having menses, you can't enter a secret building, etc., etc. Much of our lives, whether consciously or unconsciously, we are encaged by religious or human dictates. The aim of the Buddha Dharma is liberation, sama vimuti. It does not encage you into more rites or rituals. It frees you. And that is something very important. So the Buddha, in huge contrast in his teachings, utilized rational logic. He demanded everyone use his own empirical experience to see the truths of life that he is teaching. There were originally no rituals. There's certainly no secret or magical formulas. And the only rituals available is in the Vinaya for the Sangha, for example, in Katina and in ordination. And the other major difference is the Buddha insisted that the Dhamma be taught in the common language of the locality. No more a secret language or a language only understood by the elite of society. Pali is a dialect, believed to be a dialect west of Maganda. There is not even a written script. Magandhi is another dialect, and Pali and Magandhi is believed to be related and close to each other. But what we have today as the Pali Canon is actually written, or rather communicated down, in a dialect and written down in the language of the locality. So, for example, in Thailand, it will be in Thai, in Sri Lanka, Sinhalese, for us in Roman letters. 
And the only miracle that the Buddha endorsed is that of education, transforming a mundane mind into a noble one. He specifically in the Vinaya did not allow any so-called miracles to be performed. Now, prayers is another thing that the Buddha went right against the flow. Another Pindika is someone familiar to all of you, the banker who was a huge supporter of the Buddha Sasana. Another Pindika went to the Blessed One, sat to his side, and the Blessed One told him, these five things everybody wants, long life, beauty, happiness, status, rebirth. Everybody, if you look around, is praying very hard for long life, beauty, happiness, status, and rebirth. And the Buddha said, now I tell you, these five things are not to be obtained by reason of prayers or wishes. If they were to be obtained by reason of prayers or wishes, who here would lack them? Just look around. If prayers, sacrifices, offerings can obtain this, no one will die young. Everybody will be beautiful. Everybody will be so happy, rich and powerful. Everybody will be reborn in heaven. But if you look around, that is manifestly not so. And the Buddha said, it is not fitting for the disciple of the noble ones who desire long life to pray for it or to delight in doing so. Instead, the disciple of the noble ones who desires long life should follow the path of practice leading to long life. So if you want any of this, you jolly well work for it. Prayer is not going to work. Now this would have gone 180 degree hit, crashing into the established beliefs of 2,600 years ago and today. Now, this is very bad advertisement, but it is the truth. And the Buddha did not come to patronize us with nice things that we want to hear. He told us the truth. So, first and foremost, let's break a few myths. The teachings of the Buddha is non-theistic. That means it is not a belief or a faith in a creator being or an all-powerful or omniscient being. So it differs very much from the theistic religions of the day and today as well. But the Buddha did mention about devas, about beings which are higher than us. So it is also not a theistic. A theistic means you completely say no, no such thing. So it is really non theistic when while there are gods and beings and devas, whatever language we may use to describe them, they are not omniscient, nor are they omnipotent. And I think the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh put it very well, that very often we have this myth that Buddhism is a religion and that people worship the Buddha. Well, it is not a religion. It only became a religion when the British ruled Salon and demanded that these pagans must have a religion and created the word Buddhism. We certainly do not worship the Buddha. We pay respect to the Buddha. But we certainly do not worship the Buddha like people petition a god asking for divine favors. The Buddha's teachings is a practice, a way of life. And you can be anything and also at the same time lead this way of life. So it's basically the science of the mind and the Dhamma is consistent with modern science and psychology or rather modern science and psychology is consistent with the Dhamma. However, generations of students subsequently invented many, many religions in the Buddha's name many yanas and lineages and we human beings are so attached to such labels that very often we get into trouble only my tradition only not even my tradition but my lineage is true only mine is the correct teaching 
something we hear so often, ad nauseum. Let me put it to you this way, as I often share. It is irrespective of who says it, but if somebody says the earth is round, that is a fact and it is truth. And I do not care whether he's Theravada, Mahayana or Hahayana or whatever Yana, if it is the truth, it is the truth. The truth does not belong to anyone. So Buddhism, the organized religion today, may not even be recognizable to the Buddha. And many people do not even realize that the Buddha is not even a Buddhist. He taught teachings to make people better human beings. Certainly, if you understood what I was trying to share at the beginning, he was not there to start another new religion. He insisted that all his students must verify the Dhamma for themselves before accepting it, to experience it first. Ehipasiko is often translated as come and see, but actually Ehipasiko is more correctly translated as come and experience it for yourself. See whether these teachings are true. So if anyone of us among the audience here is a seeker after truth, you must first develop a doubting mind and ask questions. As far as possible in all things, ask why. So if somebody tells you something, ask why. And that is really a very, very good approach to any form of spiritual practice. For one, you will be having less of a chance of being conned. Now, I grew up in the 1970s and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, many of you I'm sure are familiar with him, was a huge figure at that time. It was a time of South African appetite. The world was very concerned with what was happening. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a voice of reason in a dark age. At the turn of the millennium, 2003, if I'm not wrong. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer and he was interviewed, possibly at that time, his last interview. By the way, he's still alive today. At that interview, the reporter asked him, that when you finally die, what would you ask God? And the Archbishop Desmond Tutu replied, oh, a great deal, he says earnestly. Why, God, did you make suffering so central to everything? And he emphasized, why, why, why? To me, as a young man at that time, this struck me very much. Here was a man who has dedicated his entire life to fighting for human rights, to his beliefs, to his religion. And yet, he is asking the very same question that the Buddha addressed 2,600 years ago. Why so much suffering? Of course, uh, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a very enlightened man in the sense that he was very much a man who respected the truth, irrespective of which religion or creed or dogma it came from. And here you will see on the internet many of his conferences and meetings with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and the two of them, you can see, are very happy people, very happy with each other's company. Now, the crux of the Buddha's teaching is on the solving of the problem of dukkha. Dukkha, of course, is poorly translated as suffering. Dukkha is a much more complicated word than suffering. Dukkha really means distress, emotional unhappiness, stress, physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain. And the Buddhas gave us a broad classification of dukkha in various categories. Birth, aging, sickness and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, decay, despair, association with the unloved, separation from who you love, not getting what you want. All this, he said, is stressful. It makes us dissatisfied. And more importantly, he said, as long as you cling to any of your aggregates, you're going to be under stress. This was the fundamental question, the fundamental problem. How can we 
be alleviated from our stress. This is what his teachings aim to relieve us of. His teachings does not aim to make you rich materially, but rich spiritually. His teachings are not going to make you have all the problems in the world disappear. No, that would be a false promise. His teachings teaches you how to deal with the problems of the world. Well, we are familiar with the word sada, and very often the word sada is translated as faith. Well, that is actually not very accurate because faith is believing in the unknown, the unproven, the unseen. If I were to tell Sister Lin Ming that you've got two arms and two feet, and Sister Lin Ming believes in me, that is faith. But the Buddha is not happy with that. He wants Sister Lin Ming to actually verify that she has got two arms and two legs. And when Sister Li Ming had actually verified, yes, I've got two arms, I've got two legs, Sister Li Ming now knows. She does not need to have faith. She now knows. So when we say sada in Buddhist terms, it is actually more accurate that this word is translated as confidence that we are confident in the Buddha's teaching, but we do not accept on blind faith. The Venerable Sariputta was given a lesson by the Buddha. And the Buddha then asked the Venerable Sariputta, do you believe what I said? And the Venerable Sariputta said, no, Lord, I don't, until I have verified it by myself. Now, if that statement had come from a student of any other teacher, I'm quite sure the teacher would have been not only insulted, but would have excommunicated that student. But the Buddha in this instant praised Sariputta and said that this is the right attitude that every one of us must have. So it is a myth. Buddhism does not have dogma. The Buddha Dharma does not have dogma. You have every right and you should question anything and everything that is told to you. Then you will be like the Venerable Sariputta. However, every one of us is different in our path. Every one of us is different in our walk. For many people, they require devotional faith. For many people, they are happy with belief. And so while many of us may start with sada as in faith, Sada as in belief, then we both slowly, or we should slowly, Subhanjaya Buddhist Association should slowly but surely educate them to go beyond this faith or belief, but into knowing, into being educated. We must always remember that the Buddha Dharma is not a dogma, it is an education that seeks that to transform us when we practice it into better people. That is the aim. So popular Buddhism, of course, has sada, the element of faith. And for one, I must say, my late mother, for example, was very, very devoted. Every evening, every night, she would chant, she would make offerings. I look back and I can see she was a very devotional Buddhist. But it would have been much better if she had gone on to study the Buddha Dharma and gone on beyond the first of the faculties. So the reality is that the Buddha's teachings is not a belief system. And certainly any fiercely devotional clinging to any belief is not going to be acceptable. The human tendency, of course, is to hold on to concepts that what I believe, what I know is the right one because that forms our ego. And that is why when somebody challenges us as to what you believe or what you know, most people turn not only defensive, but possibly even very rude and critical. 
because their ego is being challenged. On the other hand, what did the Buddha teach us? He taught us that we have to let go of our attachment, of our upadanas. And these four classifications are the attachment to sense objects, the attachment to wrong views, the attachments to right and rituals, and the attachment to a concept of self. Slowly, one by one, we have to let these attachments be lessened. Now, beliefs, as I said, becomes so important to so many people that it is my belief. I am a dash Buddhist. And we forget that in that very statement, I am is already built in conceit. Isn't that one of the higher factors that we are being trained to let go of? But yet, most of us will very much keep saying, my way, my tradition, I am, my belief, my this, my that. Many years ago, when I first started sharing the Dhamma, I was sharing in one small town in Malaysia, and there was a resident venerable there who was a good friend too. And he actually sat in the audience and listened as I shared for that hour. And he took a paper, and every time I used the word I, he made a mark on that paper. At the end of the sharing, as we chit chat, he showed me that paper and he said, Brother Puna, do you know how many times you use the word I in your sharing? That was a very humbling lesson to me, very useful, because I remember that lesson now very well. So please break this myth. There is no dogma. You can question anything. Ask why. Have a beginner's mind. Always maintain that fresh mind, a beginner's mind. An organized religion will have many answers that cannot be questioned, that cannot be challenged. Certainly the Buddha Dharma does not fall in this category. Everything that the Buddha taught, we are supposed, we must, we should think about it and question. Discuss, contemplate, reflect are the many adjectives that the Buddha used for us to learn the Dhamma. So are you a free thinker? Remember I started by sharing that when the Buddha sent the first 60 Arahants out, he told them, you are now free of all divine and human bondages. So if I now tell Sister Li Ming, you are now freed of all human and divine bondages. Sister Li Ming is free. No rites and rituals. No demands on what she must do, if not burn in hell. No demands on whether she should or should not come when she's having her menses. Come at any time. No demands on whether she must offer joystick at 9 o'clock. Must only offer three joystick. Why not four? Why not five? I used to ask my mother that. So now she's freed. But she must not only be freed. She must be freed to think. If not, it will be a life wasted. So we train as we walk this path to see the emptiness of the mental image of our self, our concrete self that we hold so dear to. The Buddha said, you will look, you will see, you will meditate, you will study, and you will realize that there is no concrete self. We are just an activity that is ceaselessly moving and changing. We are not an entity that is in any way concrete or independent or self-sufficient. He also demanded, see the emptiness of all the phenomena we are experiencing. And here, of course, we are referring to the 18 Datu, say, the three sense realms, sense base, sense object, sense consciousness, everything that you experience, they are empty. And finally, even all the concepts that we hold on to, they are all similarly empty. They do not have a concrete core. They are not eternally unchanging. 
And this is a line taken from the Majima Nikaya 22, a line which we're actually quite familiar with, but fail to appreciate often. And here the Buddha say, when you understand that the Dhamma is like a raft and that you should let go even of positive things, then how much more should you let go of negative things? What do we mean? What do we understand when the Buddha say that the Dhamma is like a raft? We all are students of the Buddha Dharma. We all try our best to learn the Dhamma every day. My boss, my wife now has the absolute luxury of listening every day to a different online Dhamma teaching, something that was non-existent half a year ago. So even COVID-19 has its good points. Now she's spoiled for choice. So the Dhamma is an instrument for us to use to be better people. It is not an academic subject to be debated on or a philosophy that is very nice sounding, but impractical. The Dhamma, the Buddha said, is a raft. What do you use a raft for? To cross a body of water. A raft sitting there to be admired, to be worshipped, to be praised. How beautiful is my raft? How right is my raft? How good is my raft? But never on the water and never utilized. It's a useless raft. So I do not care what religion, what lineage, what yana you claim to be. Are you living your life using the Dhamma as a raft to be a better person? Are you exhibiting more metta karuna, more wisdom, more compassion? Are you more conceited or are you more humble? If we want to know how far we had traveled on that raft, then all we need to do is to look within. If someone insults me on my belief, how do I react? And you will know. Say jokingly, of course, we had asked Ajahn Brahm on not a few occasions, how do I know, we said, whether this monk is an arahan? And he would laugh and he said, you could disturb him, lah, make him angry, see how he reacts. Ah. If he reacts in anger, he's certainly not an arahan. Of course, I'm sure that is said half in jest. But there is also a lot of truth in there. If all of us here had utilized the Dhamma as a raft, as we should be, then you can see the transformation of your life, my life, our lives into one of metta karuna, into one of serenity and calmness, into one of humility. Here I tell you a Zen story, a very good Zen lesson of this Zen master who stayed alone in a kuti and of a neighboring girl in a shop who got pregnant. The parents got very upset and asked the girl, who is the father? And the girl was very, very scared. And in desperation, she said, the monk. The parents were very upset, went to the monk and scolded him. And he said, is that so? And remain humble, serene, quiet. The baby was born. They brought the baby to the monk. And they said, here's the baby. You take care of it. And he said, is that so? Later on, the girl, full of guilt, revealed that he was actually the boy in town. And the parents, full of remorse, went to see the monk, apologized, asked back for the baby. And he said, is that so? This, of course, is an illustration to show you, to show me, to show all of us that as we learn the Dhamma, you become more and more equanimous. You become more and more mudita. You become more and more metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. These four Brahma Viharas become your, my, our daily life. So have we traveled on this raft? Well, just look at ourselves. The next time somebody makes Liming angry, I will know. So the Buddha is not a person to be worshipped. Certainly he didn't ask any one of us to worship him. But it is a mind state to be attained. 
and certainly worthy of our deepest respect. Calvin and Hobbes, let's say life is this square of the sidewalk. We are born at this crack and we die at that crack. Now we find ourselves somewhere in the middle and in the process of walking. And suddenly we realize our time in here is fleeting. Is our quick experience here pointless? Does anything we say or do in here really matter? Have we done anything important? Have we been happy? Have we, most, have we made the most of these precious few footsteps? I think this comic strip is very wise and these words should be reflected by all of us because we all think we have time. The reality is we do not know. So the Dhamma of the Buddha is built on telling the truth, not telling you what you want to hear. Certainly you will not read, if you believe in me, all your problems will go away. No, nope, that's not Buddha Dhamma. If you believe in me, you will be forgiven for everything. No, nope, that's not the Buddha Dhamma. Because the Dhamma is built on telling us the truth. Whether it sounds good, whether it's good advertisement or bad advertisement is immaterial. It is the truth. It may even be not the things you and I want to hear. You know that a good salesman will tell you what you want to hear. The Buddha was certainly not a salesman. He was a teacher intent on teaching us realities and the truth. Now, many people will say, and when they hear they say, oh, that's a Mahayana teaching. No, that's not true, brothers and sisters. is found in the Taragata 1024 taught by the Venerable Ananda. He said that all the teachings in total, 82,000 by the Buddha, 2,000 by his disciples, a total of 8,000, sorry, 84,000 Dharma teachings is recorded. And we might think, wow, 84,000 Dharma teachings, so much, 20,000 discourses in the Pali Canon, how to study them. But brothers and sisters, do not despair. For within this whole mass, there is a core. Within this whole mass of 84,000 Dharma teachings is the central core. Eight for the Eightfold Path. Four for the Four Noble Truths. And the Three Zeros for the Three Characteristics of Impermanence, Unsatisfactoriness, and Not-Self. I don't say non, I don't say no self, because you have an activity, but you're not an entity. So no self is not right, but not-self or non-self is closer to what is the reality. So please remember these 84,000 Dharma teachings. The central call of it is the Eightfold Path, Four Noble Truths, and the Three Universal Characteristics. This is what you and I need to know well, for this will transform our lives. So the realities of life as we stare around us, stare in our faces, whether you choose to believe in it or to live in denial, well, the truth is the truth. Whether you believe in impermanence or you do not believe in impermanence makes no difference. It will be impermanent. It is universal. It is unchanged by locality or culture or nation. So when we say something is the truth, this is the truth independent of time, of locality, of culture. Let me illustrate. When a child is born, he will die one day. That is the truth. No matter where you are, when you are, no matter whether you believe it or you don't believe it. And the truth is impersonal. It doesn't favor anyone, neither is it bent by prayers or offerings. It is simply the truth. Now, the Buddha would not have become the Buddha if not for him seeing the truths of life. And this is the Dhamma. We must realize, brothers and sisters, that we take refuge in these same truths. 
the Buddha became the Buddha because of the Dhamma. The Sangha is the living embodiment of the life as advocated in the Dhamma. So our ultimate reality is the Dhamma. We take refuge ultimately in the truth of life, the Dhamma. And the Buddha insisted that we use our senses, our mind to perceive this truth. Then you do not need to have faith. You do not need to have a leap of faith. You know. You know for yourself. No God that a human being worship or praise will make that human being a God. But you do not even need to worship or praise the Buddha to be enlightened. You only need to open your eyes and see. The Buddha certainly does not need us to pray to him or to worship him or to seek his forgiveness. But he certainly wanted us to learn to be better people, to be a noble person. The power to change is with us. That power to change is within our faculties. And you know, every one of us have these five faculties. The faculty of faith, of energy or effort, of mindfulness, of concentration, and wisdom. We need to develop these five faculties so that they become the five powers. This is a wonderful Chan teaching. Tao Zhou became Jusho in Japanese. Now, you have to remember that when Chan was at its height in China, Somebody learning it would have spent years of his life learning the suttas and then started learning meditation. After maybe 10 years of meditation, the student will go around testing his knowledge, his attainment with other teachers. There was no internet for you to Google then. And so a typical monk would cross vast distances up across valleys and hills to reach another center to see what he has learned is correct or verified or be tested. So there was a similar, there was such a monk who traveled across long distances to see Zhao Zhou, a famous master. And finally, he entered this monastery, humble monastery of the Venerable Zhao Zhou. And he asked the Venerable, I have entered your monastery. Please teach me. The Venerable Zhao Zhou asked him, Ni zi bao ma? Have you eaten? And the monk replied, Shi Fu, wo zi bao le. And Zhao Zhou replied, Ni qi xi wan. Go and wash the bowls. And at that moment, the monk was enlightened. So this conversation may sound insensible, moronic to many. But it's actually a very profound teaching, which I love tremendously. What is happening here? This visiting monk who has already studied for years under many people is seeking, please teach me. He's looking for another guru, another master, another shortcut. Now, let's look at all of us. Have we all not read more than enough? We had read, some of us have read volumes. During the Buddha's time, you will read in the Pali Canon, the monk will meet the Buddha maybe once in a long, long time. And then he will say, oh Lord, please teach me the Dhamma in brief so that I may enter into solitude, to reflect, to contemplate, to think, to meditate, etc., etc., on the Dhamma. He may see the Buddha three times, four times, five times. That's all. But we... In our great luxury today, at the click of a button, have access to 100 teachers. The entire Pali Canon is online. We have listened to innumerable talks, including this one. Done deal. And so the master asked him, the great Venerable Zhao Zhou asked him, Have you eaten? And he said, si, si bao la. Have you all not similarly? Si bao? Have you all not? read, ate, listened to so many teachers, 
Some people even collect taking refuge cards, like credit cards, you know. But the teacher tried so hard to help, such compassion. When he said, yes, I had eaten, Zhao Zhou said, qi si wan. Si wan. Si wan is the most mundane thing on earth. Enough theory. Use it now. That Dhamma is to be practiced in daily life, in all the mundane things of life. As mundane as washing a bowl. Wash the bowl. Apply that Dhamma. Use the rough. Enough learning of theory. Enough googling. Qi si wan. Use it in your daily life. Zhao Zhou is such a compassionate teacher. So let us all develop this insight, the knowledge and vision of things as they really are, impermanent, a nature, dissatisfying, dukkha, and non-self, anatta. As you grasp onto the impossible to grasp objects because they are impermanent, unreliable, you will become both disenchanted and dispassioned. You will see as you walk the path that Many things which another person might seek, one, last four, you no longer find that attractive. And remember, Vimuti, liberation. The Buddha Dharma frees you. And now you reach the Four Noble Truths. You know the Second Noble Truth, that the cause of your Dukkha is your emotional needs, your Tanha. As you lessen them, you have less causes of Dukkha. You are now on the way to Vimuti, liberation, full liberation. So what is the meaning of life, brothers and sisters, in the Dhamma? As Calvin said, before long, life will end in death. We are all from that line to this line. We are now in the middle. Some of us are closer to that side. Every one of you here who have withdrawn your EPF, you're closer to that side. The younger ones are closer to this side. But certainly we are all within that two lines. So whatever that is worthwhile and good, all that is wholesome, all that is worthy for you to pursue, it should be done without delay. And this is the meaning of life. To do all good, to avoid all evil, and to train our minds. Thank you, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. I hope that my sharing had helped you in some ways. And I shall now give back the screen to my host, Sister Limin. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Dr. Punya, for his very intriguing Dhamma sharing session tonight, breaking this news on Buddhism. Right, so let's move on to the question and answer session now, where we will take in questions from all our viewers to be answered by Dr. Punya. So we appreciate that if you could post your questions here on the comment box, and we will pick up the questions and pass it on to Dr. Punya. Don't be shy. Our speaker has even reminded us to remember to question everything. Yeah, so it's time to put into practice now, yeah, by asking questions. So, right, looks like um, they are still shy. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Punya, let us, let me start with um, one question that is in my mind. It's, since young, uh, many of us are already very used to uh, associating Buddhism right, as a religion. And even stating so, when we fill up you know, the, the, the column on religion, yeah, when you fill up uh, personal details form. So now with a clearer understanding from the next uh, sharing session from uh, Dr. Punyan, what else can we do um, to clarify these sort of like, misconceptions uh, uh, of those yet to be Buddhists? Thank you, Sister Liming. Well, we live in a mundane world where we have to fill a lot of forms and nowadays digitally. So we really have no choice 
but to put it as a religion that while you and I know that it is not so much a religion in the real sense of the word, but by convention, we have to tick that box, religion, and you put that Buddhist. Well, that's okay. That's no big deal. That's only a minor thing. But the point is that, you see, most people treat religion as an insurance policy. I mean, do you realize that for the vast majority of people, they believe in a religion because if they think that they do not have a religion and then they die and then there's some form of repercussion, then say law. So, you know, I myself pay this term insurance, go offer some money or believe in something. Then, well, okay, when I die, at least somebody will come and do my funeral, you know, that sort of thing. Now, that's an insurance policy. A lot of people do that. But that is certainly not what Buddha Dharma is like. I mean, you have karmatic Buddhists. These are Buddhists who are basically good people. But they're not interested in learning the Dhamma. They're not interested in attaining awakening. But they're good people. So when Li Ming say, oh, Subang Jaya Buddhist Association is building a new building, you know, can you donate some money? Sure, no problem. Donate. Can you light a candle? Sure, no problem. Light. So this is what we call karmatic Buddhists. They think, okay, if I do this, I will have a good return. So they don't mind doing it. But there is nothing wrong with that. In fact, I would say that the people who are karmatic Buddhists overwhelm those who are not karmatic Buddhists. And many of them are good, decent people. But I think Subang Jaya Buddhist Association should aim to move beyond that. That's why you've got Dhamma classes. That's why you've got online sharing. We want people to learn more about the Dhamma and not just stop and treat the Buddha like a big brother, like a god. You downgrade the Buddha when you make him a god because gods have emotions. God still fight. God say, vengeance is mine. God says, you shall not bow down to any other god. They still have all these things. The Buddha is beyond all defilements. So we have to educate people that, yes, 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 do all the good things that you have been doing. But along the way, learn. As I said, my late mother was very, very devout. But I would have been much happier if she had, let's say, also learned some Dhamma and go beyond being very, very devout. But it certainly still served a purpose because in being devout, it gave her solace. It gave her comfort. And so for her at that stage of her progress, yes, it was needed. Buddhism as a religion served its purpose to her. But I would certainly have wanted that she, be, have, that she have the opportunity now, wherever she is, to learn more, to go beyond. Because certainly the Buddha Dharma is so rich has so much in there that if we are just to stop and light your sticks, it is actually a big waste. So our Sunday class, our Saturday class in JB, our Dhamma classes online serve this very important lesson of educating people. That the Buddha Dharma is just more, much, much more than lighting three joysticks or offering flowers. There is so much in there that teaches us how to deal with the pains and the discomforts of life especially the psychological pain that we are all subject to. All right, Sister Li Ming? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I think it's very clear we need to actually uh, find the answers, how to actually solve uh, and also face uh, different phases of life, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so now we have um, a question from uh, Vijay, Brother Vijay Kumar. Um, he asked that um, how do we actually practice metta? on uh, people that um, we do not um, um, very much favor, yeah. Okay, that's a very good question, Brother Vijay. I have a classmate from uni called Vijay Kumar, so I do not know whether this is the same Vijay Kumar. He's an ENT surgeon today. Are you the same Vijay Kumar? Well, I don't know. But Brother Vijay, that's a very common question. How do you practice metta on someone you love, your family, your children, your wife, your parents, well, you say, well, that's easy because we have an emotional bond. So it's easy for us to practice metta. How do you practice metta on someone you do not have an emotional bond with? Well, he's your boss or somebody like that. And you say, oh, I better practice metta on him. You know, he's going to make my life difficult. So we still see that, ah, there is something there. But now what we're asking is how do you practice metta to a drug addict? to an alcoholic who appears in the ward, 
to a wife abuser who appears in the clinic, to all kinds of people who are not very nice. What did the Buddha teach us? Now, first and foremost, you have to understand that to really practice metta, you have to not just say unconditional loving kindness. You have to understand the other aspects that the Buddha taught. That first, everything is interrelated. Second, dependent origination. So, yes, I condemn the act that he's doing. But let's not condemn the person because we do not know that person, what are the conditions that had made him behave that way. And secondly, yes, it's very, very hard to go say, I love an alcoholic. So I do not expect you to see an alcoholic on the street and go there and give him a hug and say, I love you. I, I think you will probably be bluffing if you do that. But these meta here would really mean that while you cannot physically love that man, you certainly will not harm him. You will not do anything which will harm that man. Instead, you will do something to help that man. Now, my students, bless them, in the early years before COVID-19, used to have this needle exchange program. I used to be very scared. Pretty girls in their 20s go out into the back lanes of Johor Bahru and exchange needles with drug addicts because they were so scared the drug addicts are using needles they find anywhere and spreading AIDS to each other. So there's this needle exchange program where they actually give them brand new needles and say, please give me your own needle, tuck it into this box, take a new needle and use, at least don't fall sick, don't hurt your family. Now that is meta. You certainly cannot go and physically hug the man and say, I love you. But you can certainly not only not harm him, but help him. And then after that, fear, because we are so scared, because they go out late at night, I don't know what's going to happen to the poor students. Then they dropped that and they went on to join Kachara in giving food to all these homeless beggars. In Johor Bahru last time, we had a lot of people who work in Singapore. Now, of course, no more. You know, when they come back, they're so poor, they can't even afford a place to sleep because they can't afford to rent a place. So they sleep all around the CIQ, on the bus stop, in the lane, everywhere. Every night you go there, you see all these people sleeping there. They will shower, they will bath in the toilet of the CIQ and next morning go back to Singapore to work. So some of them are desperately poor. They send all the money they earn to whoever their family members are. And so my students used to have this food distribution program. They raise money and they go around distributing food to these homeless people. That's meta. That's meta. You certainly don't like these people, but you're not going to harm them. And of course, during COVID-19, I had a lot of students who were stuck in Johor Bahru. You know, when we first started, we had a very strict CMA show, CMO, sorry. All of them couldn't go home and they were all stuck. So I just went around the Dhamma brothers and sisters in JB and I said, look, I've got a lot of students stuck here. Some have money, some don't have money, some have this, some don't have this. Can you all help? And everybody came forward and said, we will send them food. We will even give them money if they have no money. So I used to tell my students, that metta is not a chant. Metta is not a mantra. Metta is action. Metta is not a noun. Metta is a verb. So, Brother Vijay, while you may not find it in your heart to love the drug addict who lives in the back lane down your street, certainly you can help that drug addict, not by giving him money, but by giving him food. So, of course, the same principle applies to a lot of things. The highest level, of course, is what the Buddha said, even someone who physically harm you, you will not harm him back. And of course, that is something which truly only an awakened mind probably can do. All right. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you. So meta in action. Yeah, that's a very good term. All right. I think um, that's all for the Q&A session tonight. So thank you very much for all the questions posed. And to Dr. Punya once again, sad, sad, sad.